Well, let's start this let's thing. Get I into guess. It. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Will, like, you know, we've been friends. We've done episodes before, um, both getting after it in our own different ways. Um, and if anybody's listening has not heard, we've done two other uh, little podcasts together. A lot of good stuff on there. We talk a lot of shit, a lot of good conversations. So I encourage anybody to go back and listen to those. But uh, first of all, Will, how's how's the gym been? How's everything been weight room wise? And how's, you know, the business and everything? Everything is going well. Second semester started a few weeks ago. So everything is good on campus, waiting on a new boss. Um, yeah, waiting for that to happen. So I did see yeah. that you just released Haas Olympic part yep. two, correct? Yep. Yep. Just an updated version of Haas Olympic. So um, I added like some more chapters to the ebook and then I added a new, not a new, another program. So it's got, the ebook is 23 pages and then there's two different programs that you can run. So those of you that don't like follow Will or, or know Will, but he has, I would encourage you to follow him and, and look at all his stuff. He's an absolute monster and he has um, Olympic lifting programs and weightlifting programs and vertical explosiveness programs that I encourage anybody to go check out because he's a beast. He has trained me himself back when I was an athlete back in the day. And uh, he's he knows what he's doing, man, and he 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 practices what he preaches. All right, twenty nineteen, the last year. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty. I played in the spring of twenty twenty, so that was yeah. my last year. So it's been now almost four years, almost four. which is kind of insane. And now I'm just a runner, I guess. But uh, <laughs> first of all, yeah. Speaking of running, you you texted me that you hit a nice five. How did that feel? I want to talk about that a little bit. How did that feel? Yeah. What? I don't even remember what it was. Was it eight minutes, 54 average pace for five miles? Yeah. yeah and your heart rate was in like one, one sixty, which is for one, a guy who doesn't, I think it was one sixty three was my average heart rate. And I didn't know if that's good or not. So I just texted you. But yeah. You know, that's, that's what it was. And I, I gotta say it was on a treadmill. So oh, and I think that makes it a little bit easier than running outside. Um, yeah, especially yeah, this time of year. Yeah. So that's if what your heart rate. If your heart rate's like over 150, that means you're, you're, you're working. Like it's not yeah. super sustainable, but in my opinion, being a, a, a non avid runner, if you can run five miles sub nine minute pace and your heart rate's not almost 200, like that's pretty impressive. And I know you do like sprint work and you're just a very, very good athlete, but yeah. Are you planning on doing more? I don't know, dude. Uh, well, my brother, and then I have a cousin, who, like my brother and I have a cousin. We all, we all do like Peloton runs together, like once a week and we compete. Mm -hmm. I know they both want to do a 10 K I'll do a 10 K. Um, I don't know if I could really do a, like a half marathon. I guess long 13 miles yeah. would be long for me. Um, but 10 K is like six point, what? 6.2 miles. 6.2. Yeah. yeah. 6. I could do that. Um, that's probably the longest I would do. I got to uh, ask, man, did you at least enjoy it while you were running? Or did you yeah, you just put a podcast it? in. Put a podcast yeah. in years ago. Yeah. The, I can't do the, music. I know. I can't do music either. Um, did you find like the first two miles were pretty difficult? And then once you kind of get yeah. in the groove, you kind of start to feel like that. I guess the, the runner's high. I'd say the first mile. After I hit a mile, then I was good to go. I don't know. I don't know if you found this and I find this really in my long runs, but what I tend to think about in my longer runs is I tend to really think about like my future and I get very, very creative when I'm running. And I don't know if that's particular, just me or if other runners feel that, or if you felt that at all, but I tend to get like my best ideas come on a really, really long run. And I tend to really, really think about my future instead of like thinking about like past and past regrets and stuff. I feel like if I'm sitting alone in my house, like doing nothing, I tend to kind of think about my past a lot more. But when I'm out on a run, I think about my future, which is kind of a, re a recent thing that I just thought about. And I don't know if you you got any of those like creative thoughts or anything. I do that when I'm lifting. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I, I don't think that's happening to me when I'm running, but when I'm lifting, because you like do a hard set and then you rest for two to three minutes or five minutes, whatever, whatever the rest time is, you kind of 
you rest, walk around, maybe you scroll on your phone a little bit and you just, you think about, well, you think about more shit. So do you think that this would be a true statement that in times of challenging yourself physically or pushing yourself or doing things that are extremely physically discomfort kind of opens up a creative way of thinking or yes. a almost futuristic way of thinking as well? Yep. I would yeah. Agree. And I, and that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Brian, you know? Yeah. And so that, uh, a big, big thing I did want to talk about with you is, uh, balance and, yeah. uh, and, 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 and burnout. And let me just like kind of preface this is, so you're, you got a lot going on. You're lifting, running sometimes you're, you know, got a lot going on in your personal life and there's a lot of things you're coaching. Um, with that, comes one of the criti criticisms i guess that i always get with like vet school and ultra running and like you know like doing podcasts and and trying to keep the lights on and pay rent is is how do you have time to do it how do you how do you have time don't you like need to sleep don't you you know how do you have the balance how do you work in like your work life balance and i get that all the time so i'll open the door what do you think about that i'm sure you get it all the time <clears throat> well it just comes down to if you want to do it, you'll do it. Like regardless. Now I have some, I do have some empathy for like parents with four kids who are in activities and like, yeah, sometimes you're, you might have a week or two where you just can't fit it in. Like that happens. But generally speaking, if you want to do it, you'll do it. And maybe that means waking up at 4 30 AM so that you can get it in before having to go to work at six or whatever it is. Or you'll work out at like 9 p.m. before you go to bed if you had a busy day. Like, if you want to do it, you'll do it. You know? Yeah. And like, that's, there, that's really all it comes down to. Are there specific ways that you like maintain your time management or specific things? Like, do you write down your schedule? Do you uh, plan everything in advance? Or what, what kind of stuff do you do? Or do you just, I get it in? I just get it in because, well, mm -hmm. one, I enjoy it. I enjoy just physical activity, regardless mm -hmm. of what it is. Um, so I don't have, uh, like some people are motivated by some sort of, uh, like, a a goal that they want to achieve. I don't really have that. I just enjoy, it sounds kind of lame, but like, I enjoy the process. I just enjoy doing it. I enjoy lifting. I enjoy being active. I enjoy going and running sprints, jumping, playing sports, whatever it is. So like, if my schedule is busy on a certain day, it doesn't bother me because I'll just adjust as needed. Like if I know I have something from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. and like I only have 30 minute breaks here and there, I have no problem just getting up at 4 30 or 4 o'clock to get it in or staying up later that like or staying up later to work out at the end of the day because I enjoy it. So yeah. Yeah. If you want to, you will. Yeah. And I don't really so have I don't have much uh patience for people who say I don't have time. You will find time if you'll find time if you want to. Well, every, like everything you do at, at, in some way, shape or form is a sacrifice. So either you sacrifice exactly. sleep, you sacrifice maybe eating a full meal. Maybe you sacrifice not going out. Maybe you sacrifice a social event at some way, shape or form, how you divvy up your time in the day is you are sacrificing it for something else. So I completely agree with you that if you really, really want to do something, then you'll just do it. There's doesn't need to be this like, well, I need to balance this. I need to balance that. A work-life balance, all that kind of stuff, all that jazz. I do not subscribe to it. I think if you truly want to be really good at something, or for me particularly, I'm more of a goal, goal oriented person and I like to like set my goals. And if I want to smash a goal, I just have to put in the work to do it. And the harder it is, the probably more rewarding it is going to be when you eventually accomplish it. Yeah. You're going to prioritize what you're going to prioritize. So like if you prioritize certain things above like being healthy or getting a training session in here and there, then of course you're not going to get it in because you're not prioritizing it. And so, yeah, I just don't have patience for people who say, well, no, I do care about it, but I just can't get it in. That's just not, it's not true. You, you don't need to sleep eight hours a day. You can sleep five hours, wake up early and, and train. Yeah. And so I think of that stuff as it's really just an excuse because you just don't really want to do it. Exactly. Yep. Which then, actually that, that, that leads me to another topic. It's, it's sort of relevant, but uh, you ever see people, are you on Twitter much? 
not really on Twitter, but like on okay. Instagram or, but I'll see, I'll, I'll see this more on Twitter, but I'll see it on Instagram too. It'd be like some sort of like a, some sort of coach, whether it's running or lifting, some sort of like performance coach saying mm -hmm. something, some version of just because you got sore doesn't mean you had a good workout, something like that. And it's like, I think that is the lamest piece of advice I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> I love having sore legs because I squatted heavy the day before. And to me, if I have sore legs, guess what? I know I stimulated the muscles of my legs at least enough to get some sort of physiological response. So like, mm -hmm. oh, I just hate some. To me, that is um, an excuse that coaches use for, for themselves to say, well, I'm scientific and I'm evidence-based because I don't need to rely on soreness or exhaustion or calories burned to show a client that I'm working, working well with them. I think um, I've heard you, I think I've heard you actually say this before where it's, it's people that are trying to overcomplicate a simple topic. And it's like, if you push your body physically, you're going to be sore. Don't try and overcomplicate it. If you worked hard, you're going to be sore. Like after a long run and my, but I will say that soreness is a good feeling because I feel like oh, I'm like, yeah. yes, I push myself beyond what my body is more physically capable of. Yes. I love having, I love being sore the day after a hard, a hard workout. That does tell me I like, I accomplished something. If, if I train and I never soar, I'm probably even thinking, wow, I probably, probably could be working harder than I am. Oh, completely. Like, yeah. No, You're not, or like, and this applies to other things. Like if I'm, if I'm not, like if I'm trying to study a lot and I'm trying to like, if I'm not like exhausted at the end of a train of, of a studying session for an exam, then it's like, I'm, I maybe could have done more. Like there's yeah. just, there's, and there, well, what all this comes around to is this, this propensity of weakness nowadays where people are just weak and they just constantly are trying to make excuses or trying to take the, take the shortcut. I hate to break it to a lot of people. There are not a lot of shortcuts in life. All it takes is just nose to the grindstone. And if, if you're going to sit here and say, well, I need to balance my life more. I, I don't want to be sore, but, but it doesn't mean that I didn't get a good workout in because I'm not sore. It's like, I got to make sure I get my sleep, all this kind of stuff. You're probably just going to lose at life because yep. life is not easy. And there, if you want to do something exceptional or push yourself or challenge yourself and overcome goals, especially physical goals, it's going to require some pain. It's going to require some soreness and it's going to require some long days and some sacrifice. Yep. Yeah. And that, well, that brings me to the topic of sleep. You can point to every study you want. I don't care about eight hours of sleep is the optimal amount of sleep you need to get to perform or to be healthy or whatever it is. Fuck that. You can live off of five hours of sleep. Like, I agree. It, it just bothered. It just bothered me when people, yeah. Do you have a whoop you band? Uh, no, but I know that that tracks your like sleep quality. Uh, my I Fitbit, love, I, I love, I used to have, I used to have, man, I have an Apple watch and I track my sleep, but like the fact that people will look at that and go, ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't push it hard today. is just insane to me. Dude, I, this is something that I am a very, very strong on is, is naps. I do not trust people that take naps. Really? Because yeah. I take naps sometimes. I don't trust you, man. This is the thing about <laughs> naps. This is the thing about naps. I'm, I'll never forget this. I walked into one of my labs. It was like a long lab. It was like 8 a.m. or like 8.30 in the morning. It wasn't even that late, but it was just the start of the day. The day has just begun. You have just woken up and you're ready to go to the day. And I walk into one of my labs and one of my classmates, I go, hey, how are you this morning? And they look at me and they just go, I'm tired. I need a nap. And I go, it's 8 a.m. The day hasn't even started yet. And you're telling me you need a nap? And so I'm just like, okay, I get it. Maybe you didn't sleep that well. Caffeine is great. And two, yeah. just suck it up. Like you're not yeah. going to be able to sleep all the time. And that's what I'm True. saying. Like the, the people that take naps, the world's just passing you by while you're napping. Like you're just lazy. Yeah. Not Fair point. You, you know, you're Fair not point. lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Fair point. yeah and so do you routinely sleep probably like five six hours a night yeah i actually just looked it up uh i think it's like my average is five hours and 24 minutes or something um actually 
let's let me pull it up quick. Can you see five hours and twelve minutes? Oh, that's yeah. Is that a weekly that, average then? That's my average. My day, like my nightly average. Yeah. Yeah. I do just fine. If I yeah. if I'm tired at two in the afternoon or three in the afternoon and I got nothing, like no other responsibilities for the day, yeah, I'll take an hour long nap. But I don't like I'm not gonna plan to take a nap. No. Like yeah. if it hits me and I'm tired and I need I need a little nap, I take one. But uh yeah, that's soft. That someone at eight AM is like, Oh, I need a nap. <laughs> it's so funny because all it is is excuses. I mean, we just get back to this idea that so many people are so weak nowadays and they're not willing to go through difficult things and it's like i need a nap oh that much running isn't good for your body oh that much lifting oh search or squatting 800 pounds man that must it's gonna come back to you when you're 40 years old it's it's gonna hurt when you oh dude and that uh i do uh like i hear like you're gonna burn out a lot i get that a lot like I, I, i don't i don't hear that as much anymore but i used to yeah, it's because you probably have have silenced it enough. You probably yeah. have been like, no, I won't. But I get it a lot with school and running. And like, that's back to like the balance thing where it's like a lot of people are like, how do you do all this stuff? It's like, you're going to burn out. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I don't really subscribe to the idea of burnout in general. And I think a lot of times, like there was a point in your life where you would do anything to be in the situation you're in. Like, I remember when I was an undergrad, I would do anything to get into vet school. And I was like, I just, all I want is a chance. All I want is a seat in that classroom where I'm being taught. And then you get in vet school. And I know a lot of people in my class have felt like that. And then you get in vet school and suddenly you're like, man, I'm burnt out. And it's like, you just forgot that there was a point in your life where this is all you wanted. And you just have completely in the process of actually doing what you wanted to do. You forgot that there was a point in your life where you really wanted this. Right. Where do you get a lot of your, like, uh, I guess your education or like information about like how you're building these programs and do you do like, like what kind of stuff do you from mentors or all personal experience or do, are there like uh, books you read or what kind of, I guess, information do you use? Uh, it might sound bad, but just like other social media people that I follow that I trust as good sources, mm-hmm. um, like Jake Tura, somebody who's like, he's written a few eBooks that mm. obviously like the Instagram post itself doesn't contain all of the, like the valuable information that kind of like sucks you to like purchase a product, but like he has some good stuff. There's plenty of people that I've like purchased products from um, that provide really high value stuff, but most of like my products, like the Haas Olympic, the Haas Project, Launch 2.0, um, I really just came up with it because I already know like basic biology, bio- biological principles i already know basic physiological principles like, i already know all of, like wolf's law like um stimulus adaptation stimulus recovery adaptation all that kind of stuff um so it's all like principle based and then you just you over time with the experience you gain more knowledge on how to apply these principles in like a practical way so yeah um it's not that the stuff that i'm putting out with my products I wouldn't say I'm like getting it from some sort of like PubMed or uh, an evidence-based source like that. Um, it's just all principle-based and then applying those principles practically through um, experience over time. Mm-hmm. That's really you, all it is. Yeah. You get a ton of like, I know a lot, I always see on your Instagram, I a ton of people that are on your programs will message you and like, or like they'll share you and tag you and then you repost them. It's yeah. like, what? Is that, that's got to be satisfying for you just because it's like, you see people kind of like, I always see like someone saying like my deadlift PR has gone up a hundred pounds and just, you know, that's got to be satisfying for you. Right. Very. And then that helps drive sales. So like, that's, that's, that's what I like the most from it, but yeah, no, it's good. Um, I think the ones, the type of testimonials that are the most satisfying, I, I don't expect people to buy my products and then run the program as the, as they're written. I expect people to buy my products um take in the information from the ebook because that explains the principles within the programs and then they can tinker with the programs how they see fit based on their goals needs their schedule um their strengths and weaknesses um so like the types of testimonials that i appreciate the most are when people say like i get tons of uh testimonials that say something like this i used to be a loaded jump like Loaded jumps are best. Loaded jumps are better than Olympic lifts. But then I got Haas Olympic and you opened my eyes to like all of the value of the Olympic lifts beyond um, like triple extension, rate of force development, power development. And then like 
those types of testimonials are the best because that means they read the ebook they understand mm -hmm. like the perspective that that i have and i've provided within the ebook and now they can apply it to themselves um i appreciate a testimonial like that more than someone who like messaged me saying their squat went up 25 pounds mm -hmm. after eight weeks uh, but i mean it's all good but yeah when i when i when it's confirmed that I'm providing valuable information that other people can then gain. Um, that's a lot more satisfying to me. Not only valuable information, but you're able to convey what you're trying to teach, which is that's hard to do to like try. And mm -hmm. I'm like, when I'm in surgery with uh, my mentor all the time, he'll like try and teach me something to do. Like, he'll be like, this is how you make this stitch with your hands or something like that. And he had like sits and like, he like, can't teach me how to do it or something. It's like, because you don't really know how to like tell somebody how to do it. That's a hard mm -hmm. thing to do. And so when you're able to kind of, I guess, get your message across in the way that you want it to be brought across, I think that is, that's kind of hard to do. And you can't really, I don't know, teach that as a coach. And that's what makes, I think certain coaches pretty good is if you're able to communicate, not only with like a specific type of person, but also to like have like a mix of people that learn in different ways and be able to share, like be able to actually convey your message for them to actually understand it. That's hard mm -hmm. to do. And then I think that's a sign of a really, really good coach. Yeah. It's, and there's really no way to get better at it than just practicing it. You know what I mean? With a, like a you, lot of things in life. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to do it, do it, do it, be shitty at it, be shitty at it, be less shitty at it. And then over time you kind of gain confidence with yeah, delivering adequately delivering a message that's simplified and easy, easy to digest for the people who are consuming it. Um, you just kind like, of dude, go, hey, did you ever go back and look at my old YouTube videos? Like my first YouTube videos, they were so shitty. They're like six minutes oh, yeah. long. The editing was terrible. I would like stutter my words like I am now. Um, <laughs> it was, it was bad. And just, yeah, I've developed over time how to, and obviously I, I edit the videos to make myself sound better than what it probably was in real time. But yeah, yeah my I've, first videos are so bad, so bad. Of course I watched them. Of course I checked them yeah. out. But <laughs> I mean, I, it's the same thing with mine. Like I look back at some of my stuff or I looked at even like I listened to one of my earliest podcasts a while ago and I've done about a dozen now. And I'm like, you sound like an idiot. Just like the way you're trying to talk or like, the you could tell like you're a little nervous and stuff and it's just yeah that's like most things in life like you just kind of got to embrace it you're just gonna suck at it like yep. everybody's gonna suck at first it's just how it is and eventually you're gonna suck less and less and less until you're pretty good at it and then you become really really good at it and then you can teach other people how to not suck so bad and right it's a lot of things. that kind of sparked right. an interesting question that um i kind of want to ask you is well how do you like how do you handle failure in in oh, in yeah. your own in your own head i guess it depends on what i'm failing at if it's something important if it's something not important i don't care um because it's not important if it's something important um i don't know dude i like i have a my coping mechanism is like to work out <laughs> and <laughs> i think that i i think that's healthy no, a lot of people would a lot of people would probably say that that's unhealthy but no i think that's really healthy like yeah if I, if I fail at something that's important, I'm probably going to go into my garage, put a podcast on or, or lift in silence, or maybe put some music on, but like go alone, think about just think whatever I feel, just think about life, um, come to terms with it, I guess. That's, that's what I would do. That's how I cope with failure. I, you know, I've had like, uh, you know, like just like I've had a few months in the past that have been like difficult in times, um, you know, personal things or like I failed at something or like just some issues. And I just, you know, I always tell people, I was like, miles still need to be ran. Weights still yeah. need to be lifted. Dogs still need their ACLs fixed. So for me, my coping method, uh, mechanism, every time I start getting like, if I'm ever like frustrated or angry or any of those negative emotions that I feel like I need to do something, dude, I strap my hokas on and I go for a 10 mile run and I come back and I'm like, all right, I'm back. Like what's next. And I'm the same way where I think if you can actually bring it out in a physical way, because other people yeah. drink, they smoke, yep. they, you know, beat themselves up, you know, and overeat. that's why I, overeat is a big one overeating. Yeah. And so that's why if you can actually, like if you have all these negative emotions that are tons of motivation 
if you can, the, the secret is, is you need to be able to channel it into a productive matter, whether it's physical or maybe some sort of mental trick or something or like to way to better yourself. And that's, that's like a secret because you're going to have those moments where you're going to have all these negative emotions. Everybody gets angry. Everybody gets frustrated. Are you going to go grab a bottle of Jack or are you going to go for a 10 mile run? You know? Right. Yeah. Well, that actually brings me to another, uh, kind of topic, similar relevant, um, is like the idea that when you're stressed out, that you just need to relax. Mm. I don't think you need to relax. No. You find relaxation in being productive. Like you just said, just go be productive. If you just go be productive, you you can naturally just relax because you know you've done something like virtuous. You know you've done something good. You know you've done something productive. But if it's just like, I'm stressed out, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a me day. I'm going to take this weekend to just focus on me and relax and recover, take a nap. nap. Yeah. (laughs) Like that's, that's unproductive because you're just like setting yourself back. You're not accomplishing anything. You're not pursuing uh, whatever goal that you were pursuing before you started relaxing. You're just setting Mm -hmm. yourself back. So yeah, that's being productive. Just go be productive. Do something good for you. Go do something good for uh, your spouse. Go do something good for your family, friends, whatever. Go do something good. And then that's going to help you relax because then you're, then you're not stressed out about it. Anything anymore. Completely. And that's like, to me, that's the, you have in like times of like sympathetic overdrive, you have the fight or flight or yeah. there's a third element freeze. To me, that's what just relaxing is in times of stress. It's either flight because you're just avoiding the issue or you're freezing and you're not going to do anything. So me, on the other hand, I choose to fight. So if I have something that's stressful in my life going on, or I have a day, like if I wake up in the morning, yesterday, I had like a 16 hour day, I had class all day, I had to go check on this cow, I had to do a bunch of stuff. And I woke up in the morning, and I was like, this is gonna be a long day. Good. I love it. Like it's those stressful days. I love that. Because you can like, that's when you start getting progress in your life. And you start doing things productively because in those moments of stress if you freeze or run away from it there's no growth but if you choose to either face the issue or do something that's productive you then can move much further in your life than just allowing then delaying the inevitable that eventually i'm gonna have to face this like even something for me like if i'm stressed or something about you know whatever um you know, something as simple as just like making your bed and cleaning your house a little bit, like helps, like just give you some forward momentum. Like, okay, I have all this disaster going on in my life. I'm disorganized. I have a hundred emails to read. I got to do all this stuff. And it's like, start checking things off little by little. And you start getting momentum and you start yeah. like, okay, well, I just took care of all my laundry. Now I got to go run. Oh, it took, just took care of my run. Now I'm going to go study for this exam. You got to start building momentum in those moments mm-hmm. of stress. You can't just be like, I'm going to go now. Or I'm going to watch Netflix right. for three hours and leave waste all these time. problems for tomorrow. Complete waste of time. I am a big fan of the idea of delayed gratification and return of investment. Like I love doing things that suck because I know at the end, it's going to feel good. It's kind of funny. I always tell people this, that I hate to run, which is everyone's like, that's crazy because you are the most active runner I know, but I'm like, no, I hate to run, but that feeling of being done with that long run or crossing a finish line of a race like is the, it is so worth it. And so I'm a big fan of suffering now so that you can be gratified later. And it's the return of investment is you can put it on a microscopic scale or a macroscopic scale. So the microscopic scale is I'm not going to eat like shit today because that way I can have a good run this afternoon. That's the return of investment. So you delay the, but then the macroscopic scale is I'm going to spend my twenties working my ass off towards something I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to spend money. I'm not going to do drugs like an idiot. I'm not going to sit here and and scroll through Instagram. I'm not going to sit and scroll through TikTok. All this waste of time garbage, all this short-term gratification. Instead, I'm going to put all that stuff to the side. I'm going to wake up every day at 5 a.m. and go do my thing. And then in 10 years from now, I might see the fruits of my labor. It might not be for 10 years. It might be for 20 years or 30 years, but eventually it'll pay off. But you need to have the foresight to be able to see that. And you need to have the ability to think in the future and not think in just the current moment. And so for me, people around you, 
like that? You know what, man? It is. I think it's hard because it's really hard in my, you know, I've, I've, this is something that I've kind of been frustrated with ever since I got done with football was like you ex like, it's just, it's hard to be surrounded by, it's hard to meet. You know what? Let me rephrase this. It's when you try and transition from being like, I guess, extraordinary or do something unique or do something difficult. There's like a really long phase of where you don't really have a lot of friends because your old friends aren't coming with you because you want to move on from what they're doing and what they enjoy, like going out all the time or doing drugs. But then you still haven't reached the point where you're surrounded with the crowd of people you want to be like. Right. And I've found now recently, like I'm starting to become closer with like my mentors and surgery. And like, I'm talking to like, there's people like ultra runners that I've become closer with. And I'm starting to kind of get like-minded people like me, but there's been a lot of times in the past few years where I've said no to doing something social because I knew it wouldn't help because I have a race in two weeks and you feel very alone at times. And I think that's kind of part of it. And part of me kind of finds motivation in that because I'm like, I'm doing something different. I was just talking to my friend Ian, we were in the library yesterday studying and there was like nobody in the library. It was a complete ghost town. And I told him, I said, I love when I come in here and there's nobody here because you feel like you're doing something different and you do feel like you're doing something unique. Dude, wait, how old are you now? 25? 25, yeah. Yeah, I'm 30. Dude, each, as I get older and older and older, like the people I, I associate with just get smaller and smaller and smaller for that exact reason. Yeah, well, eventually it's like, if you're going to sit here and you're going to give me shit for wanting to not go out, or you're going to give me shit for what I'm doing or like for wanting the way to, I live. Really, it comes down to wanting to like better yourself and better your situation. Yeah. And I'm, you know what? I don't have, like you, we said, I don't have time for people like that. I don't have the patience yeah. for people that are going to sit here. And like, if I say, Hey, I'm not going out tomorrow. And they're like, Oh dude, come on. You don't ever go out. And it's like, shut the fuck up. Like, no, I don't want to. I'm a grown ass man. And if I want to do this extraordinary thing, you're holding me back. So why would I be friends with you? Yeah. I think a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of people in their twenties waste their time. And then in their thirties, they end up doing what they should have been doing in their Mm twenties. So then they don't, they're already a decade behind. Like if you can just dedicate yourself to living like almost a monk lifestyle and just working really hard towards something in your twenties, you, you are a 10 years ahead of most people. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, you said it's really hard to find people. It's dude, it's really hard to find people who are, um, I guess who are like-minded and have the same sort of drive. Um, and it gets, yeah, it gets lonely. Not just, not to like sound like a victim or anything, but like, I just don't have that many people that I want to associate with because it's like that you said, so I, I've never really drank, uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't drink now, but like if someone gives me shit because like I'm drinking water and other people are like getting shit faced or something, it's like, I should be making fun of you for that. It shouldn't be <laughs> yeah. you making fun of me for that. You know, it's kind of, that's, a, that's low IQ. That's what that is. It's low that IQ. Is. Yeah. You know? Or, uh, yeah, just like what I said, uh, like my coping mechanism is to go work out if something's gone wrong in my life and I need to like I I need to get my mind back back into it. Um and people say that like that's an unhealthy behavior. It's like no uh, it's just it's insane. Yeah, that's unhealthy. Do you um, yeah. this is and this is more so asking when you were probably in your maybe your earlier twenties or mid twenties. Did you ever find yourself kind of feeling that kind of aloneness and almost like thinking like, man, like what's maybe like, there's something like, like wrong with me. And I have to act like a different person in front of these other people, because I do kind of feel lonely. Like, do you ever fall into that kind of trap sometimes? Or you like almost try nah. and pretend to be somebody you're not? Not really. Cause I am kind of just an introvert naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, and like when people like in college, in college, so, you know, Swede, um, oh, yeah. So like I would always hang out with Sweet on like a Friday until like 7 p.m. Because that's when he starts drinking. And then he goes out to the bars at like 11 p.m. And it's like what I would always do is I'd go hang out with friends. And then when they start to drink a lot, I would just like go back to my apartment by myself. Um, and I was totally OK with that. Mm. Um, I just had I had no interest in doing things like that. 
I wanted to be able to get up at seven in the morning the next day on a Saturday, mm -hmm. you know, like I have no, I've never had any interest in like going out till two or 3 AM and then sleeping in until noon and then doing that all over again. Like I want to be you... able to be productive the following day. Yeah. And I think recently I've adopted that. I mean, I don't know if you remember, like when I was in my early twenties at UND, I was always at the bars till the lights came on. Like I didn't know I that at the, well, I was just, I was partying a lot more and I just, and then, you know, once I decided that I kind of wanted to go to vet school, all of that kind of went away. And now, man, I like when I'm out, if I'm like somewhere out or like a social event where there's drinking and I like, if I'm drinking, I'm like, I just want to go home and then I'll yeah. just go home. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's, I found that when I was younger, I was a lot more inclined to be like that. And then I think the moment I decided I want to do something better with my life, like go to vet school and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then that kind of led into the ultra running and stuff. You, you then kind of fall into that because you're like, why would I care about this when I'm going after this feeling of running, crossing the finish line of a hundred mile race compared to a weekend of partying, dude, does not even compare. Like, right. There's so much cooler shit to do in this world and if you're in your 20s and you're like going out all the time you do not have your priorities straight at all no no yeah it really like i said it should be the opposite like i should be making fun of the person who is like getting drunk thursday friday saturday not the other way around yeah do you feel like uh do you you've always been like that or did you like kind of learn that from like your parents being good role models or like brothers or like what what kind of made you like this hyper disciplined, hyper focused, ambitious person? Definitely my parents. Um, my brother was not a good role model in that sense. <laughs> uh, my parents, my parents are good role models in that way. Like they're both mm. really successful people, um, disciplined people. They're both mm. in shape. They're in their sixties and they, they they work out. They play sport. They play golf and tennis, awesome. and pickleball and stuff. Like they're good examples, but uh, I've always just kind of naturally been that way, mm -hmm. I guess, too. I don't know why, mm -hmm. just how I am. All right, you got to head out. Yeah, I should, probably go, I should probably go get some lunch before I go back to campus.